even if you've been before, God's work in our life is progressive. It doesn't stop. Warfare is ongoing. It doesn't stop. So being in an environment where God can touch us is very powerful. Anyway, what I'm going to share with you is I want to share a message called Relationship Keys from Eden. Relationship Keys from Eden. I want to share with you some things the Lord showed me uh, just going back into the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden. And uh, three things that he showed me in there that I use all the time. They're so powerful. And uh, so I want to just open up some, some things out of this book, uh, out of this uh, first part of the book. So the first thing to, to recognize is God has designed us for relationship. We've actually got the need for relationship, the capacity for relationship, and the, the, and the design for it is built into us. And so when we look into the book of Genesis, Genesis is the book of first beginnings. And so often when something appears in Genesis or whenever it appears in Genesis, that's the first mention in the Bible. It sets the pattern for what follows. So when you're reading your Bible, if you find the first mention of something sets the pattern right through the Bible. So you always want, if you're looking on a subject, you want to go back and see what was in the beginning. What did God say? What was the intention and then you go from there. Because we live in a, a, a nation, in the, in the Western world particularly, where relationships are not understood and people struggle because they don't know how to build relationships. They haven't seen it modeled in families. And so we've got to go back to look at it. And there's, there's, there's a lot I could share, but I'm going to share some with you that will really help you. So I want to read from Genesis 2 verse 18. And it says here, now God has been doing creation and all this great work. He's created the, the stars, the sun, the moon, the sky. He's created the earth, created all kinds of things. And every one of them, he said, it's good. It's good. Awesome. What a great thing that was. You go out into nature. Wow, that is spectacular. That is good. But then he comes up and he said, there's one thing that's not good. So God said, it's not good. Here it is. And verse 18, the Lord God said... It is not good that man should be alone. So there's one thing that's not good, it's being alone. God says it's not good. And that's because he sees the bigger purpose he's created us for, and he sees that if you're alone, or you're an isolated person, or you're a person who doesn't know how to build relationships, or is cut off from relationship, it's not good. God says it's not good. That means it's really not good. It means there's real problems there. And we look at the rate of suicide, the immense growth in the rate of suicide, mental health breakdowns. These are all evidence of broken relationships. Not good. These are the side effect or the fruit of it. Not good. Not good. And uh, so we're made in the image of God. The Bible says, let us make man in our image. God is relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit flow as one. So the God we're modeled after or designed after at his core is relational. That means you are designed to be a relational being. You're made for community. You're designed for it. So we're going to look and see the breakdown of relationship and what God does about it in a moment. So here's another thing. We, we, you cannot become fully into the image of God without relationships. So we live in a culture, everyone's independent, want to do their own thing. But God is a com builds community. God is building a community called the church. And even if it's got flaws in it, God uses even that to bring growth in our life. So think about this. God has designed man to be his son, his daughter, or his image bearer in the earth. So you're designed to be an image bearer. What does that mean? That means you're designed for three things. You're designed primarily for a relationship with God, spirit to spirit. You're a spirit being capable of engaging with a loving, powerful God, a spirit being. Secondly, we're designed as, as sons and daughters. We're designed to represent what God is like. Now, I won't go into all of that. That's for another time. But, but just put it like this. You are designed, if you're going to be God's representative, that means you will relate to people and treat people like he does. I love to say that again. 
If you're designed to be his representative, it means at least this thing, is one thing it means, you're designed to relate to people and treat them like he would. So think about that. So, so our living out our Christian walk is living out being a representative of God relationally. You can't do Christianity alone. You just can't do it. That's, a, that's not good. Okay? And so, uh, so we're also designed for responsibility. That means we express our relationship with God through service. So it's all about relationship. So sonship, the design for sonship, and I've shared on this, and I'll do another series on it later on the year. It's primarily about having a relationship, communication, connection, uh, exchange of life with God. It's about representing him, relating to people as he would relate to them. And it's about responsibility. It's about um, sharing with him or expressing the relationship with God by working with him to extend his kingdom can't get away from those things. So you can't represent God without relationships. It's just impossible. It doesn't matter what experiences you've had, what encounters you've had, they're all wonderful, they're necessary, they're part of our journey with God, but you cannot isolate from the person next to you. You can't live out your Christian walk without connections and relationships. They are the most wonderful things when they're working well. They're the most painful things when they're not. But you can't do without them. <laughs> How about that? See? And, and so it says, it, like in 1 John uh, 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another for lovers of God. Everyone who loves. Now, that you, you don't just, well, I'm loving. No, no, no. Love finds a practical expression of kindness and service to people. In other words, love is always relational. And he says, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In other words, the characteristic that makes you a, a, to be identifiable as a believer is how you relate to people. He said, and that's what he says, he who does not love does not really know God. So if you don't know how to love people as God loves them, you actually have a very limited knowledge of God. Because the, the, your, your capacity to love and connect and relate to people is the reflection of how deep and authentic your walk with God is. It's all getting real quiet now, isn't it, eh? Yeah. Yeah. See, so our relationship with God is revealed by the way you treat people. Think about that. So if all you want to do is just do your Christian life, never build community, never be in any relationship, never be in any group, never be in any service, that's not good. That's actually bizarre, distorted. That's kind of claimed to be a God person, but you're not. Notice what he says here in, in uh, 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If a man says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. How about that? There are a lot of liars in church, aren't there? For, and here's it. For he who doesn't love his brother he's seen, how can he love God he hasn't seen? So what he's saying is, God puts people in front of you to test the authenticity of your love. So every person you're connecting with is your challenge to love. It's a challenge for you to reveal what you're made of. Hello? <laughs> and this is the command. It's not just a suggestion. This is the big suggestion God has. No, no, it's not a suggestion. He says, this is the commandment we have. He whoever loves God, who loves God. Okay must love his brother also. Must love his brother also. So in other words, if, if you say you love God, the way you work it out is not just through your personal walk with him, it's how you treat people and love people and are kind to people and serve people and engage people. You cannot separate the two. They go hand in hand. One helps you going deeper into the other. Okay, so, so God has declared being alone is not good. Isolated, separated, on your own, doing your own thing, not good. Not good. Not good. So, so just coming to a meeting, well, that's on the way to good, but it's not that good really. God wants you in relationship because you can hide in a big crowd. It, it says, here's another thing, thought on it then. Isolation from healthy relationships 
is the primary evidence you're broken and unhealthy. Better say that again. Isolation or separation from meaningful relationships or healthy relationships is one of the primary evidences you're broken. <laughs> you're damaged. Something's not right. Something needs healing, restoring. So as we come into community, and particularly where the Spirit of God moves, He causes it to flush up. Pastor Dave was talking about that before. As you walk with God, as you're in a community where the presence of God comes strongly and powerfully as we unite our worship, and God reserves a portion for the corporate worship that's not available privately. Why? Because He wants us to come together. So in that corporate worship, we start to feel things surface, things come up that are hidden because God wants to bring healing. How about that? So it says, uh, uh, Proverbs 81, whoever isolates himself is seeking his own desire, in other words, or doing his own thing. So when a person isolates from meaningful relationships, from community, then basically they're self-centered, doing their own thing, and, it's, and the Bible says uh, it is, uh, he breaks all sound judgment. So here's a key then. Here's an important key then. God uses relationships with people to mature and grow us. God uses relationships with people to mature and grow us. Isolation from healthy relationships is not good. Okay, that's a, that's a good way to start thinking about relationships, isn't it? See, how many know you now need them? Okay, then. I'll give you the second thing, then I'm going to show you some three things that God does. So, so here's, here's, a, here's the next thing I want to share is God is an initiator of connection and relationship. Remember, we see we're made in His image, therefore we're made to relate to people like He does. Well, here's one of the things. God is initiator. In other words, God does not wait in the corner for you to come to Him. God is an initiator of connection and relationship. You think about it. When you got saved... You didn't even notice how many people God sent to you representing Him to get to talk with you to try to bring you to connection. Lots of people. You just didn't notice that it was God doing it. It was just these random kind of invitations to come to a meeting or something happened or someone showed you something and you didn't realize actually God is orchestrating people representing Him. He is initiating connection. God is always that. See, in Genesis 3, 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Now notice now, does God know that Adam has sinned and failed? Yet he still seeks him out. We want to cut him off. That's not how God treats people. We want to cut off and label people. But God doesn't cut them off. He doesn't, do, he doesn't do life that way. He doesn't do people that way. He sees the value of people, even if they're broken, and doesn't cut them off, seeks to engage them and connect with them. That's why Jesus, the big complaint against Jesus in Luke 15 was he accepts sinners and publicans and eats with them. That's God initiating connection and relationship. So if you're going to be a representative of God, here's one of the characteristics. You don't stand in the corner waiting for someone to talk to you. You are an initiator. You go connect. Hello, how are you? My name's Sona, who are you? How are you? And you start the connection process. Church must be the most friendly place in the world because if we're representing God, God is all about connecting. So don't just connect with your mate. Find the people in the crowd who are new. Oh, hello, how are you? Welcome here. Great to see you here. It's not the welcome team job. It's everyone's role. Make people welcome in your world. Make people welcome in your world. And even if they're weird and dress funny, look funny, tattoos, it doesn't really matter. Whoa, wait, make them welcome. I remember someone coming one day and they had this purple hair. It's really Brilliant purple, tattoos everywhere. I said, man, that's an amazing hairdo. How long you had that? And they, they kind of thought I'd be in reaction mode because it's so different and strange. But no, I thought, well, how unique, how bold that you could even think to have that and not worry what people think. That's amazing. And you could just see straight away the, 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 the wall and barrier just drop like that because you're just welcome. 
because I want to meet them. Hello, who are you? I want to find out who you are. And I'll show you how God does it. It's just such simple things he does. So you notice there that God is always seeking relationship. Right now, if you don't know God, he had drawn you here. Maybe you had this big idea, I'll just go to Ascend Global today. No, 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 no. God was drawing you by his spirit because he is seeking an intimate relationship with you. He always does that. Do you know the Bible tells us in two places that God's eyes, God's seeking for something. So you think, what is God looking for? Well, in the, in the book in Chronicles, it tells us the eyes of the Lord roam, through, roam to and fro through the earth. What is he seeking for? Seeking for someone whose heart is loyal to him or has a genuine, authentic desire for him. God is looking everywhere for that person. He's looking for that person. He's seeking them. In, in uh, John chapter four, Jesus uh, was talking to a woman. He told her uh, and gave her revelation. God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So both of those scriptures say God is seeking something. What is he seeking? He's not seeking you to be a good person. He's seeking for you to be a relational person. He's seeking for you to be in connection with him. He likes to be with you. I know that, see, if you get all religious and legalistic, you'll all be caught up with sin and everything that's wrong with your life and not understand, actually, even when Adam had sinned, God still goes looking for him because God loves him and his heart is to bring him back into relationship. It's always to bring people back into relationship. That's what God is like. Don't cut people off. That's not what God does. He, he finds ways to draw them back. He's seeking people who will enter relationship with him. Do you know something? It's not a matter of just putting your hands up and just worship. God wants your heart. He wants a love relationship, communication with you. He wants to enjoy you. He created you for his enjoyment. And so he wants to be in your life day by day, through the day, enjoying you doing what he designed you to do. When you discover your passions and start to fulfill them and then bring God into it, he likes your day. He likes being with you. He likes to share with you. He likes to help you do what you do because he knows it better than you do. It's just, don't compartmentalize life and God. You, if you do that, you're very religious. It's not how it works. Relationship is always relationship. If, if you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. It doesn't matter whether you're doing good or doing bad, whether it's up or down, prayed or didn't pray, whether I really, really did bad today. It doesn't change. I'm still a child of his. I belong to him. He's still my dad and loves me and wants to connect with me. So you've got to see your walk with God is about that. It's not about, did I come to church? I'm not come to church. I read my Bible. It's not about, the, those are things that support relationship building but it's the relationship he wants. He's not trying to keep count of everything you did wrong to accuse you. The devil's the one who's accusing you. God's desire and heart is to gather you and enjoy you day by day. Oh, you all got so quiet on that one. But it's, it's true. It's what he's looking for. The Bible says it's what he's looking for. And so, so God initiates connection. Now, what is not always obvious? You've got to actually think about this for a little bit. Now, if, if you want to connect with someone and that person's really done something wrong and they know they're really guilty and they're in hiding and all that kind of stuff, what kind of attitude do you got to come to them with? It says in Jeremiah, it says, with loving kindness have I attracted and drawn you. So when it says that God's presence came, there was an overwhelming atmosphere of love that enabled Adam to come out of hiding. You see, God attracts people with kindness. So, so if you want to engage people and build relationship, do what God does. He attracts people through kindness. Nasty people don't attract anyone. Angry people don't attract anyone. Smiley people, kind people attract people. <laughs> kindness touches people's hearts. Kindness opens their heart for connection and engagement. Kindness the Bible says God is full of loving kindness. Yeah. Kindness is something you do. You actually take an action that is kind. It's caring of someone. And kindness softens their heart. 
So, you, so God, is, God shows kindness. He says in Jeremiah, with loving kindness, have I drawn or attracted you? How about that? I'll give you the verse because you want to get that one now. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared of old to me saying, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. In other words, I've always loved you. From the moment I first thought about you, I was in love with you. And I've never stopped loving you. And I use kindness to attract you to me. Think about that. So God always draws people. So our relationship with him is just the response to him loving us. Let's say that one again. See, that is quite deep. Aren't they? Our relationship with God is our response to him first loving us. 1 John 4, 90, we love him because he first loved us. So, so God knew of Adam's condition, but he still loved him. And he still showed kindness to him. He comes and presents himself. Adam, where are you? I want to connect with you. See, so love doesn't change because someone behaves badly. So that brings us to another key, and it's described in this series we're going to be doing in the small group, Keep Your Love On. Choose love and connection when people fail. Choose love and connection when people fail. Don't get offended and cut them off. Choose love and choose connection. Be the one who initiates connection. Are you one who initiates connection? Why don't you? Why don't you? If you would just think about that and, and start to let God search your heart, he'll show you why you're not doing that. Something's broken. So he wants to fix that. But he can't fix it if you won't actually face it. So what I'm gonna show you is I wanna show you how God met with Adam. And it's, a, it's something the Lord showed me a while ago and, I, and I've, I use it all the time. And basically, he asked them three questions. When you look through the Bible, you find that frequently God asks questions. So he spoke to Cain. Cain, where's your brother? That's like God didn't know he'd just killed him. Where's your brother? He, he said to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here in the cave? Now, of course he knows why he's there. He's afraid and he's running away and he's done it and he's hiding in the back of the cave. He knows why he's there. It's not like God doesn't know the answer. God knows the answer. He asked the question to get you to think about what you're really doing. Like with Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you love me? You see, God uses questions to get you to think about where you're at. And so, what you find is that God asks three questions and offers three invitations to man. And if you would think of, if you can remember the three questions he asks and then understand what the three invitations are. I'll, I'll give you the questions, they're quite simple. Adam, where are you? That's the first question. Where are you? That is an invitation to connection. It's an invitation to connect. I really wanna connect with you, where are you? It's not like God didn't know where he was. This is not a location question. This is a relationship question. I'll come back to each of these in a moment, but it's an invitation to connect. The thing, then he said, well, I was naked. I was afraid because I was naked and I ran away and I hid myself. And he said, who told you were naked? Here's the second question. Who told you were naked? So that's, the, that's uh, an influence question. What's influencing your thinking? Who are you listening to? That's a good question. Well, who are you listening to? about your decisions and where you go and what you're doing. What voices are you listening to? We'll come back to that in a moment. But basically, it's an invitation to disclosure. He wants him to open up, talk, talk to me. What's going on in your world? So you notice there the invitation is first to connect, secondly to open up and talk. And then the third question is, oh really, simple one. Did you eat the fruit of the tree? Now, of course, when you read it, you've got to really kind of think, you're going to put an attitude in there. Did you eat the fruit of the tree? Then it wasn't like that. This is an invitation to be responsible. This is an invitation to restore the relationship. It's not a scolding, did you eat the fruit of the tree? You know, it's not like that. That's, we, we put that in there because that's how we see God. But he didn't do it that way. He's giving him an invitation to restore the relationship by fronting up and being responsible. So you notice then three questions, 
the <laughs> very where are you which is the invitation to uh, connect who's talking to you or whose voice is he listening to you it's an invitation to disclose and open up your life so you can have that relationship and third the responsibility question which is an invitation to be responsible for your part in putting this relationship right that's how God works so I, I use those things all the time with people but you've got to start where God says. He starts off, well, where are you? Where are you? Okay, let's go back and have a look at each one of these questions then. So the three questions, three invitations, and here they are. So, so as I said, it's not, a, it's not an invitation, it's not a, a, a location question. Where is he? Where is he? I can't find him. Send angels. There's nothing like that. It's actually, where are you? You see, I could ask you that question today. Where are you in your journey in life? Now, you see, it'll be different from where you were last week. That's why if I'm going to come to meet with you and engage you, I want to know where you are in your journey. See, if you don't tell me where you are in your journey, how am I going to know how, what kind of interaction can we have if I don't even know where you're up to in your journey? I'll come up with something that's irrelevant to where you are. But what if I was to approach, and this is how God does it, he approaches with a heart to connect and to get that connection, he has to get the person to talk. So he asks the question. God asks questions to open up what's going on in people's lives. And the first thing is, where are you? Now, you may not even know where your spouse is right now. Or they're sitting next to you, but you don't know where they are in their inner journey. Their spiritual journey, their emotional journey, their relational journey, you don't know what's going on until they share. And if they don't share with you, then they're alone, even though they're married, and that's not good. You can be in a group, but if you don't share where you are, how will anyone connect with you? You'll be doing what Adam did, hiding, because I'm afraid and ashamed. So see that first question, it's a very, very profound one. So, so it's a very simple one, where are you? And so God, here's the key, here's key number three. God uses simple questions to connect and engage and discover where people are. So you initiate the connection, hi, how you doing? Great to have you here. Now, it's not the answer, well, where are you? It's not, <laughs> you're actually asking a range of questions they give them room to talk about what's going on and where they are in their life. What's happening? What's the biggest challenge you've been facing? In other words, you're giving them, you're inviting them to open up and talk about what's going on. Now, if we don't get to that level, you've just got a whole lot of people superficially connected. Real connection is when you can actually feel safe to open up and talk about what's going on in your life and know you'll be accepted and loved and people are there to support you. That's what community looks like. It's not a meeting. Stop thinking about a meeting. Meeting is really for a purpose of engagement. Okay then, so, so there's the question. So where are you? So God saw the condition of Abraham, uh, of Adam, didn't withdraw from him, but he just showed the value he placed on him by coming and presenting himself meeting him, and then engaging him, see? So sin and brokenness will cause people to cover up and hide and be alone, but we can actually do something about that. Where are you? Let me just enter your life. Let me walk with you a little way and hear your story about what's happening in your world. That's how you enter someone's life. You can do that anywhere. We do it on planes and trains and bus. We do it everywhere we go. And if you're willing to listen, people will talk. They will tell you where they're at. Sometimes they say, I don't even know who you are. I'm, I'm telling you more than I've told anyone else. I was with one couple one night, and the, woman, the wife was, she was a Christian, and her husband was unsaved, and they invited two, past, two of his pastors to come for the meal. Husband didn't want us there, but anyway, he had to put up with it because his wife organized the meal. And so I could see he's full of fear about having two pastors there. So I found a realm of conversation that was common to him we could talk about and once we got talking, I was able to ask the question in a roundabout way, where are you? And he told me. And his wife is like, I've been married 20 years, he never told me that at all. In other words, he had never disclosed where he was. 
He never disclosed what was going on in his world. And she hadn't asked the questions and engaged with him to let that happen. I was there to meet him and find out who he is, where he is, how he got there. Do you understand? It's not a complex thing, is it? You can do that. You just got to learn to practice that. See, so love places value on people and initiates the connection. You can do that. You can do that. So people, of course, go through all kinds of experiences. So you don't know from one day to the next where someone is at unless you ask. That's why you want to build a family meal time and get the family talking. It's to find where they are so they connect. If you've got TV and phones going, you can't do that. You've got to be quite intentional about providing opportunities where you can ask the question, where are you at? Where are you in your journey? What's going on in your world? I want to enter your world without any form of judgment and discover what's happening. That's, it's so powerful. You know what? People need someone in their life that'll ask them, where are you? Everyone needs someone who cares about them enough to ask, where are you? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you really doing? And it's the absence of someone caring enough to ask how you're doing that leaves you alone and not good. So I've had people in my life that whenever we get together, they'll ask how I'm doing. See, Bob would be one of those. I don't think I ever meet with Bob where he doesn't ask how I'm doing. You understand? It's, it's about caring for me as a person. Whereas everyone else doesn't want to no. know. This is, this is how you build a connection. You, you actually care enough to enter their world and find out where they are. Because what happened last week and where you were last week with them could have changed dramatically in a week. They'd have a crisis. They've got some problems overtaken them. They're bound there. And this, last week they were laughing. Today they're about suicidal. And you don't know unless you ask, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> where are you? And there might be some today and you're in deep distress. Have you told anyone? Or another way, do you have anyone who would ask where you are that knows you well enough to see, hey, hey, things don't look too good. What's happening? Where are you? How are you doing? <laughs> oh, okay. It gets very quiet when we talk about this stuff. It's just sort of simple. Anyway, and of course, if you're going to ask questions, you need to be willing to listen. That's a problem. So here's another key then. Listen from the heart to understand them. Don't be quick to jump in with your answers. A lot of people, they're listening. They're already working out their answer or something to say. They're no interest at all in hearing what they have. When I get around people like that, I just stop talking because you're not interested. And I've been, I was amazed. I, 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 was, I was, had a, a, a meal for pastors with, Pastor, with Apostle Malnado. And I thought, this is your chance to ask them questions. And they all want to talk about themselves. I sat there in amazement. And of course, he was just nice to them. I'm thinking there was a well of wisdom for you to draw from, and all you want to do is talk about yourself. How stupid is that? Actually, to tell them the next night, don't be stupid. Don't do that kind of thing. That's just, that just lacks wisdom. If you, a wise man will listen and learn. So don't be too quick to talk. Be quicker to listen. So in Matthew, Jesus taught in Matthew 13. He said, he, said, um, he said, in hearing you hear and don't understand, seeing you see and don't perceive, for the heart has grown dull. So what he's saying is very simply is that if your heart is self-centered and bound with problems and issues and sin, you won't have ears to really listen to people. That listening to people comes out of a heart that cares enough to want to know where they're at and understand them. To understand them takes a bit of skill and listening. You think of Solomon. Solomon's just anointed and appointed uh, as the king of Israel in 1, Sa in 1 Kings 3 verse 9. Here's his prayer. Most people know that he asked for wisdom. Well, it says God gave him wisdom. What he prayed for was this. Give me a hearing heart to understand this people so I may judge well. In other words, he's saying to make decisions in leadership I need a heart that listens and understands what the real problems are. 
So it's to do with your heart, your desire to really get to know, your desire to connect and, and, uh, and be of help to someone. That's the prayer. So we could pray that. I pray that every day. That God will give me a heart to hear what is going on in people's lives so I can understand them. That's how you can engage them quite deeply. Okay, so there's a key. Okay, so here's the, here's the, we'll get to the end of it now. Here it is, the invitation to disclosure. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So notice that God's questions draw him out and he starts to disclose. And he discloses the three key problems he has. Number one, a shame. I was naked. So shame, that, that whole thing of shame, uh, he lost the clothing of glory. He, he, he felt broken and damaged inside and he was gripped by feelings, there's something wrong with me. I'm broken and I don't want anyone to see me. Now, when people are ashamed, they become afraid of being exposed and they then have a strategy of hiding and concealing. So you see the three things. Number one was shame, I'm broken, something's wrong with me. Two, I'm afraid if I let you see me as I am, you're going to hurt me or reject me. And so I got to do something about that. I got to cover and hide. And then I become isolated and alone, not good. So, so you notice the three steps that take place there. Shame, broken condition. Now, there's a lot of reasons we can experience shame in our life. If you have an area of your life where you have shame, maybe there was abuse, maybe there was betrayal. Betrayal leads to shame. Maybe there was rejection. Rejection leads to shame. If you've got an area of your life where you're, there's shame, failure can lead to shame. Some families shame people. They, they, they call them names and abuse them, and so they carry a deep sense of shame. If you've got shame in your life, next thing with that will be fear. And fear will make you afraid of what people are going to do to you, and you'll try to conceal what you like and put on a covering so you look better than you really are. Does that make sense? So it says, first of all, they, they put on fig leaves. They covered their identity. So we put things on to conceal our identity. Listen, for many people, Facebook is just a fig leaf. Social media can be just a fig leaf. It, it has the blessing of being able to connect, but for most people, it's the putting up of an image and they're not really living that life at all. Fig leaves are anything you put to hide who you really are. And that's, that keeps you alone, not good. Keeps you isolated, not good. See, it says they hid in the trees. Trees are a picture of any activity or busyness that you create in your life so you don't need to connect. It could be your work. If you're a church person, it could be ministry. It could be your hobby. It could be social media. It could be TV. It could be sports. It's where you, it's not that they're bad in themselves. It's just you're hiding from connecting in a meaningful way. That's what makes them a problem. And so Adam and Eve hid. And that's the pattern with every person. Basically, they're in hiding. And it takes a person who loves them and asks the questions and wants to engage that can pull them out. That's when they'll talk. If they feel safe and the fear levels are dropped, they'll talk. If they get defensive, it's because they feel the fear level's too high and now they're trying to hide. That gives you a huge insight into people, doesn't it? Huge insight into people. There it is right there in the garden. How about that? So, so the, 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 the influence question, God asked him, he said, who told you naked? In other words, what is influencing your life? And the reality is hidden evil spirit beings influence people's thoughts and emotions and relationships. Paul wrote about it. He said, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's against a hidden spirit world that manipulates people's thoughts and emotions. So how about, here's another key then. Be aware spirit beings manipulate people. So pray for people. If you want to build a better relationship, pray for them. Secondly, clarify what people mean. You've got to ask the questions and never assume you really know. Get feedback. Those are simple keys in relationship. And if you want people to open up, reduce the level of fear by showing in a heart that's really accepting of them. Here's the last one. We'll finish with this one. It was the invitation to responsibility. Here's the question. Did you eat the fruit of the tree? So again, how you say that is, is everything, isn't it really? Did you eat the fruit of the tree? You know, I'm ready to jump on you if they are. Now, 
He just said, did you eat the fruit of the tree? And he's inviting him to be responsible. Now, here's what Adam, here, it's a simple one, that one. There's two answers to that. Yes, no. It's a simple question. Did you eat the fruit of the tree? Yes, no. It's a very simple question. But he didn't give a simple answer. He tried to gaslight God. And there's consequences for that. So what you've got to understand that when God comes to you, he's seeking reconciliation and repair of relationship. When God is asking the question, did you eat of the fruit of the tree? He's inviting him to become responsible for his part in damaging the relationship and manning up. All he had to do was say, Father, I'm so sorry. I actually violated your law. Please forgive me. And the game would have changed because God would forgive him. So he gives opportunity to be responsible. Very important concepts in here. I, I, I won't go into them too deep. I'll just give you a few things about them. But he's, he's basically seeking to restore the relationship. You're not trying to cane him or judge him or put, put anything on him. He's just giving him a chance to front up. Because here's the thing. You've got to treat people like responsible adults. He, God's not coming like an angry father to berate a child. He's coming as an to give him an adult-adult relationship. Will you stand up and own your part in this relationship? Will you do your bit to fix what you've broken? And here's how Adam responds. So here's a key. Give people an opportunity to be responsible and do the right thing. Give people an opportunity to do the right thing. Maybe they will. But you should give them the opportunity, not just go into caning them for what they've done wrong. Give them an opportunity to front up. It's the whole thing of freedom is what it looks like. Freedom requires you recognize and take responsibility for where you mucked it up. You'll see that as a foundation for freedom. So if you've got a broken relationship, what did you contribute? Own up your part and see what you can do to put it right. Okay, here's some things that God does. Now, I want you to see this is very, and then we'll finish with this bit here. When it comes to relationship, although God is loving, initiates relationship and is kind, he don't take no dumb stuff from people. And I want to show you just something here because this is a mistake that people make constantly. God will not accept you gaslighting them. Now, the word to gaslight someone means literally this. It means to lie or deny or refuse to admit your failure, even when you're shown the evidence. I mean, the guy's standing there without a glory cloth. He's actually standing there naked. God's just saying, did you eat the fruit of the tree? The, the evidence is right there in front of him. And he tries to gaslight God. Now, one part of gaslighting is totally denying when faced with the evidence that you're trying to actually turn the conversation around. The second thing is where you put the blame on someone else. Notice what he says. That woman, you gave me. That woman, you gave to me. You understand, he's implying that God is responsible for this situation because of the choice he made about the woman he provided. He is gaslighting God. You can never gaslight God without consequences. So how does God respond when we try to blame him, deny what's going on, cover up what's happening, put the blame on him, put the blame on something else? He ceases communication. God will not let himself be dishonored by that kind of treatment. He guards his honor. And while he is loving and, uh, and kind and sacrificial, if you start to treat him dishonorably, he will then withdraw and stop his communication. He will now set a boundary on the relationship so you can't treat him that way. And he will require that consequences come. And that's exactly what God did. One of the mistakes we make is that we try to rescue people from the consequences of their dumb decisions rather than helping them grow up and take full accountability for them. When you do that, you end up with a dysfunctional marriage, dysfunctional family. God never behaves that way. He will not rescue you from the consequences of your problem. 
He will wait till you take responsibility and engage with him and put it right. Then he'll enter your world and help you. You may still have the consequences, but he will help you. So God sets very strong boundaries. He won't let someone dishonor him, treat him disrespectfully. He will withdraw. He will require consequences. And that's exactly the next time God talks to Adam, talks to Eve. The next time he talks to them, he says, because you ate of the fruit of the tree, because you did this, here's the consequences. And then he puts a barrier and stops them gaining access to his presence. Think about that. In other words, you can't gaslight God. You can't blame Him for stuff and expect to then have intimacy with Him. You, you can't blame other people and expect to have intimacy with Him. He requires you be responsible, that you step up. So don't, 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 don't shield others from the responsibilities of their mistakes. Let them learn from it. Let them carry the consequences from it. They get parents and they, they overprotect their kids. They're like helicopter parents hovering around and they're, they're not letting them grow. They're not requiring they be responsible. And they end up with terribly dysfunctional relationship and you feel dishonored by your children because of that. You can't allow that to happen. Put a boundary. I won't be treated that way. I won't be spoken to that way. I won't be disrespected that way. Our conversation ceases until you change your attitude to me. There it is, it's in the book of Genesis. People put up with all sorts of stuff and they shouldn't be putting up with it. So God uses consequences and boundaries to maintain His honor, so should you. If you're gonna act like God, you do the same thing. Now here's, the, here's the last thing. That even though He set a boundary and even though He made them take consequences, He still loved them and was still kind to them. Later on, we see he, he made them coats of animal skins and clothed them. In other words, he never stopped being kind. He just wouldn't allow them to treat him dishonorably. Now, that's an important thing for you to understand about how God operates and how we are to operate. There's a lot in that passage, isn't there, right? So just go back and just pull it back together. God initiates relationships, so should we, because we're made in His image. What stops you initiating relationship? What's holding you back? Isolation is not good. Why are you isolated? What's bringing shame to your life or fear to your life? Why are you adopting a strategy of hiding rather than coming to your Father who loves you? And the three questions, where are you? The invitation to connect. Hey, where are you? What's happening in your world? Who you've been talking to? What's, what's influencing you? What thoughts are going on in your mind? Wow, where'd that all come from? And would you stand up and own your stuff? I wonder today just how many people here, you're struggling with isolation. And as I've spoken, you suddenly realize, oh my, I realize what I've done. I've internalized stuff instead of bringing it to my father. I need to break out of my isolation today. It was a bad choice. It's not good. And it will not end up well for me. If you've struggled with shame in your life, you say, and it's brought me in isolation, what has caused that shame? Why don't you just bring it to the Lord today? If there's fear in your life, you say, man, I'm afraid. There's, I'm afraid of punishment, afraid of rejection, afraid of this one. Listen, that fear is keeping you isolated. It's putting you in a prison where death and hell torment. If you're in that prison today, God wants to help you out of it. And He invites you. You're not going to fix it all up. He's going to say, would you acknowledge your part in getting in there and repent of it? And He will then come at your invitation to help you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you're living a life without God, you're living a life just without the presence and the love of God, without a sense of purpose, living a life bound by sin, the torment that it brings. Today, you could make a step. God invites you to come and receive Jesus Christ. To everyone who received Him, He gave Him power to become a child of God. You understand that the initiative has been made already. God just says, will you respond? Why don't we close our eyes right now? Close our eyes. Thank you, Lord. The presence of God came in the garden. 
and the voice of the Lord. Where are you? Just while your eyes are closed and heads are bowed, where are you? God wants to know where you are. Basically, wants you to admit where you are. Are you isolated, discouraged, carrying shame, carrying fear? God's invitation is will you front up, will you man up and own up to the stuff and turn away from it and let me come in. Jesus came to give us life and give it abundantly. He came to make us a life giver to people. But it starts with a step. Why don't we just stand together? If that's you today and you say, I need the touch of God. I need to actually break out of my isolation. I realize I've built walls in my heart to cover myself, conceal myself. I want to first of all come to the Lord and bring that to Him. Then I want to connect into a small group, into some part of the church, a team, some place where I can start to build relationships where someone will know me well enough and care about me enough to say, where are you? How are you doing? What's happening in your life? Would you come? Would you come right now? I think there's quite a number of people. I thought the Lord say He wants to break you out of your prison house of death and torment, wants to bring you to a place of life. Would you come? Would you come right now? Come, come, come to the front quickly. Come, don't hold back. That's you. The invitation is there. And God's presence is going to come to help you. Come, there's others need to come. Others need to come and you're wrestling with that same issue of isolation, relational isolation, emotional isolation. Come, come, come now. Adam, where are you? Ha! I'm over here, Lord, hiding. I was afraid because I was in such bad shape. But here I am. Okay, will you own up? Will you front up? Perhaps there's someone here and you've never given your life to Christ. It'll be a great day to come and give your life to Jesus. When you make your way to the front, come here and I'll, I'll lead you in a simple prayer to, to let Jesus come in and access your heart and life and bring a change. Thank you, Lord. We have the ministry team come and just people come to be with people. Church, would you reach your hands out to the ones who are here? A lot of people up here today. If you know someone that's up here, would you come and initiate friendship and just stand with them and put your hand on their shoulder? It's saying literally, hey, listen, you're not alone. I'm with you. Come, come and do it. Come and do it. If it's your mate up here, come and stand with them. Don't let them be alone. That's what church is about. It's about being together, community. Would you come? Would you come? Some of you have a broken heart. Some of you are hurting very badly inside. Would you come? Okay, right. Okay, that's great. I'll, I'll leave it there in a moment. Lord, let your presence come right now as you came to Adam in the garden. Lord, full of love, let your presence just begin to fall upon people now. Once the music come down a little bit, there's some people here who want to give their heart to Jesus. That is the most, that's the most wonderful decision. That's the best decision you've made in a long time. It's God inviting you into relationship to forgive your sins, give you a fresh start. When you invite Jesus Christ to be your Savior, to come and to break the power of sin that's brought isolation to you, he will come and forgive you immediately. Every sin, every wrong behavior, thought, immediately it's power broken and you're forgiven. His spirit comes into your heart and life. You get a new beginning. You become a child of God and he will never leave you. He will never turn away from one of his children. So I want us all to pray together. Those of you that are giving your heart to the Lord, just make it known to the person in front of you, the counselor, whoever's there. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for reaching out to engage me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Lord, I ask you to forgive me my many sins and failures. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your Spirit into my heart. And I thank you, Lord, for a new start. I'm connected to Almighty God. I have a new beginning, a new life. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, let's give them a clap. Some people over here. Okay, for the rest here, the rest that are standing here, I felt God is going to just pour His love on you right now. He's not judging you. He loves you. He believes in you. He understands your pain, your loneliness, your grief, your shame. Talk to Him about it now and release it to Him. Lord, I chose to isolate instead of bringing my pain and my issues to you. Lord, I forgive those who've hurt me. I, I renounce all judgments I've made about people and life. I renounce any vows I've made to protect myself. Lord, I've tried to carry the weight of others. I, relic I let that go to you, Lord. Lord, I bring my disappointment out to the open. I really am disappointed. I am discouraged. I'm struggling. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. The amazing thing is how God helps us first is He comes to be with us in the midst of our struggle. When it says the Holy Spirit is a comforter, that word comfort, that God comforts us means He comes to be with us, alongside us, in the midst of our trouble and put into our life the strength and help we need. Would you let him do that right now? Let someone pray for you. Just tell them what you need prayer for and let them pray for you and just release the love of God into your life. God loves you. God loves you. He wants to help you. Let him touch you right now. And church, reach your hands out to people. Come on, reach your hands out to people. If it's your friend up there, come up and be with them. Even if there's someone else here, you can come up and be with them. Thank you, Lord. And don't forget, we've got small groups gathering. Get in a small group. Start to do this course on relationship called Keep Your Love On. Stay connected with people. It'll do you good. Thank you, Lord.